Hi there! Welcome to Floating in Books. My name is Maika. Today I'm going to be telling you all about the books I read in 2021. Yes, 2021, because I didn't update you on those and I thought we could still chat about them. So I read 11 books, just 11, in 2021 and I'm not gonna go on too much about why I didn't read that much in 21. There is a reason. I, I, I just wasn't really having a good time the past year, year and a half or so. Uh, and one of the things that suffered immediately were my reading habits. So I only read 11 books in 2021 and maybe in the future I'll tell you a bit more about what was going on, why I haven't read that much, and also when you see my update for 2022 of what I've read so far, um, I'm also, you'll find that I've also changed reading habits quite a bit since 2021. But yeah, I did read 11 books and I thought that I could do a nice roundup video of all of the books I read. Now granted, these are, like, it's been a long time since I read these for the most part, so I'm not sure how much I can actually say about these books, but we'll talk about them and I'll have you updated on what I actually read. So before I forget talking to talk about these books, I want to talk about the books I don't have physically with me. One of them is an audiobook and that's The Boy, the Mole, the Fox and the Horse by Charlie Mackesy. And this I read as an audiobook and it, it was read by the author and after I read that book, I immediately bought it in Dutch for my five-year-old niece because I was like, okay, great, this is like the new Winnie the Pooh. This is an adorable children's story about um, a boy, a fox, a mole, and a horse, and they they just form this band and it's filled with little like whimsical things and apparently like the book book version, if you have the physical version, it's got all these lovely drawings that he's made, but the audiobook version was really, really nicely staged. I believe they had like some music in the background and it really felt like a full experience. It really made the pages come to life because he didn't just read the story, but he also told you about little quirks of how the pages came together. And I really enjoyed it. I listened to this on a walk as it was snowing. So <laughs> this, was, this was a thing, this was a thing for sure. And I think that just added to the magical setting and like the book just really came alive for me. And it was a really, really nice one. I gave it five stars. It was one of my top reads that year. The second book I don't have on me physically is because I borrowed it. My mom lent me The Avond is Ongemak by Marike Lucas Reineveld. This has been translated into English, so if I can find the English title, I'll make sure to uh, pop it on the screen here. I believe it actually won prizes for like one of the best translated works of that year as well, or, or like last year, um, and that's why I also wanted to read this. So it is a Dutch book. Dutch books are never very pleasant. <laughs> um, a lot of Dutch books are about heavy topics, so you always need to make sure that you're aware of the trigger warnings. This has trigger warnings for child abuse and death in the family and grief. Um, it's about a rural family in the Netherlands. They have like, a, a, like a, they're farmers, I think. They have cows, I think. And they live in this area that's pretty religious as well, so it's quite a conservative family. And then one of the children dies, um, what, her brother dies of the main character. And it's all told from this like childlike perspective. And then how this family copes with the fact that this boy is no longer there. And sort of the psychological impact it has on the different people, but especially this main character. And sort of how she deals with things and it, I think it follows her for like a few years and there's a lot of parallels here with the Dutch author's actual life so the person who wrote this has experienced some of these things so that's why it's a bit of a different one for sure it's not a nice tale it's not a pleasant tale and actually the fact that it's written with this like childlike innocence actually adds another layer of atrociousness almost to it. So it's a bit of a weird one. It's definitely not for the faint of heart. Dutch books never are, I find. Um, but yeah, it's, I think, an important book to to be told. And I, I almost read it in like a single sitting, I believe. And then we need to talk about the books that I have lying here. Let me filter out the Dutch things first, because I started reading Dutch books. I think I did a haul of like all the Dutch books I bought, because I'd read a Dutch book in 2020, really liked it and I was like, okay, so Dutch literature isn't as drab as I thought it would be. So I had this really negative connotation aligned with Dutch literature 
because my Dutch teacher in school just really took the joy out of reading for me, and it was through reading English that I refound, rekindled my joy for reading once I started to be able to read English books, and of course, reading English literature for my degree. So I just discovered other stories because I was able to read in English, and I just felt like the Dutch things just kind of fell behind, so I finally started reading some. Um, so I read Magnus from Mar Arjen Lubach, and this is again also slightly autobiographical, I believe, but this is about a guy who has a form of epilepsy and then his relationship falls apart, and then he finds out that his financial details are used by someone in Sweden, and he tries to go and find them because he's like, he's, he, his life is in shambles anyway, so he goes to Sweden, e eventually finds the guy, <laughs> <laughs> who has been scamming him, who's been using his credit card details to, you know, make purchases. And then it kind of snowballs and spirals from there. So it's a, uh, it was okay. It was a fun read. I, d I don't think I gave it a lot of stars, but it was enjoyable. It's not as drab and sort of heavy as a lot of Dutch books are. Um, it was fun. Um, it's about characters and all the people he meets on his travels through Sweden and his relationship with his girlfriend and how that is going to go and also his relationship with himself and his self-confidence and Magnus is actually the name of one of the characters he meets in Sweden and I feel that they are sort of like juxtaposed like this is one person who is like this and Magnus is this guy who is like this and they are sort of like the, each other's opposites which I enjoyed as well so it was clever, it was smart it was sometimes trying to be a bit too clever I felt though so it was a good one and Arjen Lubach in case you are unfamiliar with Dutch culture he's the guy who created at least he, him and his team, he didn't do it by himself, but he uh, had a TV show called Sondag met Lubach and they created the America is the greatest country in the world, but the Netherlands is second video that went viral a couple years ago. He's behind it, he does a lot of these kind of like stints and he writes books as well. Then another Dutch book, I think actually my mom gave this to me. This is Ramzi Nassos de Fundamente, and this was the Dutch Book Week essay of 2021. So every year in spring we have a book week in, du in the Netherlands, and if you buy a Dutch book, you get a Dutch book that's been written especially for the week for free, but a author also gets a chance to write an essay about a topic they like. And this is definitely sort of like a social critique on our society today, and how things, how everything is falling apart, and I felt this was very cleverly done. Ramzi Nasser isn't just an author, he's also a actor, and he does a lot of other things, and he's definitely got some thoughts in here that I agreed with. I didn't agree with everything, um, which is usually the case, but it, it, it had some good thoughts, and it really sort of helps you to like sharpen your ideas of what's going on in the world today, and I thought that, that was also the purpose of the book, so I definitely felt he achieved in that. What is a year without some Ben Aronovich? I think he releases books every year that are spin-offs from this Peter Grant series or that are part of the main series. There's also a graphic novel series that's part of this realm, but I skipped those pretty much because I read the first one and I didn't quite pretty I just didn't like the experience, so I've never really gone back to those. But I love the pretty uh, Peter Grant series. It's a book I've already like the next book that came out this year. I've already read as well, but last year we just got some novellas. They finally bundled all of the short stories and like, look, like all of the loose bits, um, and somebody bundled it into Tales from the Folly, um, and this was pretty hard to find actually, but this, this is all of the short stories that are connected to the world, and I don't often read all of the short stories in a series, but this is one that I hold so near and dear to my heart that I had to read them. It's just, it's a lot of like, the extra pages that you get in special editions and like the missing chapter that is here and like a short story that was written for like a charity event. So it's all like loose bits, so there's not like much going on here, but I always enjoy this world, so I did really enjoy this this reading experience. What was released that year was this one. This is what Abigail did that summer, and Abigail is the cousin of Peter Grant in the series. She makes a few appearances here and there in some of the books, but she was awarded her own short story, and I really enjoyed it, mainly because I think Abigail is one of the best characters in the book. 
she's not only Peter Grant's cousin, but she's actually a little bit better at magic than he is, which kind of irks him. And since we get everything from Peter's perspective in the books, she seems just like your average annoying teenager. But this book is written from her perspective and her quirk is that she can, that she can talk to the foxes. So London is infested with foxes in case she didn't know um, because the city has just sprawled into their territory. So if you live in a London suburb, you don't have pigeons or seagulls like we have here in the Netherlands that are raiding your, your, your trash, but they have foxes. But she can talk to them and they are her sort of band of like spies and they have their own code because these foxes all speak, speak in code because they're all like secret agents, they think. Um, and I'm still not sure whether that's a gimmick, like it's like just like a humorous bit or whether they actually are. It's sort of like a fine line there. And Abigail finds out about this place where children goes miss go missing and there's a, a boy that summer that she is hanging out with and then he goes missing as well. And then there is this one house where she finds out they all go. Uh, and then she's trying to, of course, solve the mystery. So it was a lovely read. I like how snarky she is. She's really clever and she's just a great character and it was great to hear more from her perspective. Um, I read some more urban fantasy. This is The Last Smile in Sunder City by Luke Arnold. I believe he is an actor too. That's what I think I read somewhere and this was his debut novel. I kind of picked it up because I liked the cover design and it very much reminded me of some of the Rivers of London books. It sort of has a grittier layout. This is like a darker, almost like dystopian kind of fantasy world setting. I quite liked it. It had some steampunky kind of elements. It kind of, it gave me Batman vibes. If you've seen the latest The Batman with Robert Pattinson, it has that sort of gritty Gotham-like sort of like infested with crime sort of vibe to it. Do I still remember what this is about? Not really, but I remember enjoying it at the time I was reading it, but the plot is lost on me completely. <laughs> that kind of sums up my past year and a half, I kind of feel. But yeah, this, this book was a really good one. It was an entertaining read for sure. Do I need to read more by this author? Not necessarily. An author I do keep reading from is Genevieve Genevieve Cogman. She writes the Invisible Library series and this is I think the eighth book in the series. There are ten out. I've read all in the first eight. This is the secret chapter. In case you're unfamiliar with the series, it's about a librarian called Irene. So yes, this is about books. But in this world, the Invisible Library is an institution? Is that the word? I always doubt whether it's institute or institution. My English is just going down a drain by the minute. But she works for this company, well, company, um, and they deal in books that have different versions in different realms, and these books need to be collected to establish world order. And along her travels across these different realms, she meets fairies and dragons, and some worlds are more infested by fairies, and the other worlds I have are more dragon-heavy. Her apprentice, who she falls in love with, is a dragon and there's all these like great like classic stories at the heart that need to be found so there's always a mystery a detective element we've got some fantastical elements it's got a hint of steampunk a hint, hint of urban fantasy and then at the same time we have a little bit of Sherlock Holmes in here because one of the characters she interacts with in one of the worlds where she lives is very much inspired by Sherlock Holmes for sure so I really enjoy these books they're not very long and I just, I, I think I've been reading them ever since the first one came out. And I just, I think one a year is released every December and then I just buy them. And then usually over the summertime, I read one. One of my favorite years last, uh, reads last year was this one, Matt Haig's The Midnight Library. So this is a book that's very hyped up. I found this at my local bookstore and it just sounded intriguing to me. I'm not sure what the main character is called anymore. Nora. So Nora finds herself in the Midnight Nut Library after she tries killing herself and she's given like five minutes to twelve to in this library setting and she can travel to all these different lives that she could have lived if she had taken different decisions. So she kind of gets to explore that what if moment that you have. Uh, what if I did this? What if I had achieved this? What if I had chased that dream? What if I had dated this guy? What if I stuck in this relationship? 
and she just sort of, we get all of these different lives and she can stay in the life until she no longer feels satisfied by it. And after a while she finds a life that seems very ideal, idyllic and then things still sort of fall to shambles. And I really like the moral of this story. It was very endearing. It was very fast paced because some of the lives she's only in there for like two seconds before she drops back to this midnight library and she has to find something else again. And across her travels, she also finds a couple of characters who are also on their own journey of finding this life and seeing if they might like them or not. So yeah, this Midnight Library I thought was a very endearing story. I know not everybody likes it. It's more magical realism than it's actual fantasy. And I just like the way this plays with the idea of what would happen if. And finally, in 2021, I got myself stuck in the N.K. Jemisin, uh, the Broken Earth trilogy. And I have to say that I got stuck in this because this is what caused the reading slump. I think I already started reading this one first and I still soldiered on with books two and three, not because I didn't enjoy them. I just found that how dark and bleak this, these books are in combination with a pandemic and my mental health not being the best, <laughs> It just wasn't a really great combo. So I think I, I started reading this in the middle of a lockdown and I just struggled getting through it. And not because I didn't enjoy the book at all. I actually quite enjoy the series. I can see why people love it. But for me, it just wasn't the right book at the right time, which greatly impacted my reading experience with this. I just didn't love it as much as I thought it was going to um, because this is so hyped up and so raved about and one thing that no reviewer has told about that I have heard raving about it is the way the story is told. We get an I perspective, we get a you perspective and we get a third person perspective and that shift in perspectives just really threw me for a loop. I It just really put a distance on the story. I like that we're getting a fantasy story that's told in a different way, don't get me wrong. I think the magic system is clever. I think the characters are flawed and yummy and great and you want to love them and hate them at the same time. So I like all of those things, but just the way it was written down, it just felt I couldn't fully engage with the story and it took me until the second book, until I really felt like I could really feel anything for these characters. And I actually thought after finishing the first one that maybe that perspective switch might have like been let go for books two and three, but we still get the same perspective. And I do feel that in the end, it all comes together really nicely. And I like what these books do. And now that I've read them, I do really appreciate them. And like I said, I really like the world. Um, so I can see why this has won prizes and why so many people love this. It just wasn't for me. And it wasn't for me at that time, but I did go back to it because I did like them enough to soldier on, but I did have to take a break after reading that first one and read some more like whimsical fun things because my head just wasn't in the right place for reading something this dark. So those were all of the books that I read in 2021, just 11. And this also made me realize that I was better off reading some audiobooks. So if you would like to stay tuned for more, then I'm going to share with you my 2022 reads from January until June. I have read some books since June, but I'm going to do like a summer wrap up of like the things I read over the summertime from like July, August and September. And I'll be updating you on that in October or November, I'm sure. Um, so yeah, that's going to come next, but I thought I could sort of split it in half because in 2022, I did read many more books than I did in 2021. So I've already read double the amount of books as we're talking, like more than that, um, because I've read 25 by now, I think. And I think that by the time I do my update for the summertime, I may have already hit 30. So I'm actually thinking that I could get really close to hitting my reading goal this year of 50 books. Uh, which I just set myself every year and I don't care if I make it or not, but um, some years were more successful than other years. So yeah, um, that's it. What I wanted to share with you today. Thank you so very much for joining me. Please stay tuned for more. I'm going to be making one video a week on this channel for sure. If you also like makeup related content, then check out my main channel because there I post three to four times a week. So I hope you like to stay tuned for more and I hope to see my next video.
，拜拜。